If you would grab your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 8. We're going to continue. Uh, it's the second week of our series called Signs and Wonders. We're just looking at these miracles of Jesus. So on the screen now are scriptures I'm going to use this morning as we unpack this text. So I want to invite you uh, to turn in those scriptures to you. Uh, there are apps you can find on your devices that will help you with uh, scripture. Uh, but I can't encourage you enough just to bring a Bible and to have one you can write in. I don't think it's sacrilegious to write in your Bible. So you can do that, um, highlight things, ask questions, do all that. We're going to read these uh, few verses, uh, verses 14 through 22, and then I wanted, what I want to do then is put it all, like I do, in context and then come back to it piece by piece. But we're going to go from there into an interesting story in Acts chapter 19. So we'll get there eventually this point. Let's just read this scripture together, and then we'll ask the Lord for his help. Matthew chapter 8, verse 14. And when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law, this is Peter's mother-in-law, lying sick with a fever. He touched her hand, the fever left her, and she rose and began to serve him. That evening, they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons. And he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. Now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. This is, he's on one side of the Sea of Galilee, the Lake of Gennesaret, and he wants to go over to the other side. And a scribe came up to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Let's pray together. Father, we need you today <clears throat> to give us uh, understanding and wisdom to know your word. This is yours. You wrote it through your spirit, through the hands of men and women. And so God, now we just ask for your help that we might know what you intended us to know through these scriptures. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I don't know uh, where you find yourself on this spectrum, but how many of you, if you go to a wedding, how many of you stay until the very end of the reception? How many of you, are, you finish the wedding out? You're staying for the cake and the garter and all of it. You're staying for all of it. Uh -huh. And how many of you are like, no, I'm out, I'm out. Like, if, if it keeps going, I'm still waiting for pictures from a wedding last night. We're still waiting for pictures to be taken. And you're like, I'm, I'm out of here. So last night, uh, there was a wedding uh, that I was honored enough to perform, and uh, we had our kids were at a friend's house, so we had to come and pick them up, and so we left early, but sometimes you go to weddings, and you, you just know, like, something good's about to happen. You, you know what I mean? Like, you look at the bridal party, and you know, I don't want to miss any of this. Like, I don't want to miss <laughs> what's happening. Uh, and so last night was one of those, like, man, I feel like if we leave, we're going to miss something really magical that happens, but we had to leave. All right, now what about sporting events? How many of you, uh, you would, no matter what the score is, you're staying till the end of the game? You're going to stay. You paid the money, darn it, and you're staying to make, get your money. All right, and how many of you are like, no, I'm out, I'm out. If it's a blowout, I'm leaving early, beating traffic. Yeah. So the older I get, I'm learning I really don't like crowds. I don't like crowds, and I don't like traffic. The older I get, that's how I feel. Now, when I was younger, I paid that money. I'm going I'm to watch the whole game, right? So I'm going to watch all nine innings, all seven and a half hours of this baseball game. I'm going to watch all of it. Uh, and then I had kids, and we tried to take kids to a game. And by the third inning, I'm like, so, want to go home? Are we done? Are we done here? <laughs> There's that moment. I remember uh, a number of years ago, went to a, a Braves game at Old Turner Field. And so we're there. And uh, remember at Old Turner Field, whenever you left the stadium, you, you really had to remember where you parked your car uh, because it was in some neighborhood somewhere on somebody's driveway. You're like, I, I got to get there before they have to leave for work. And so you get out and... Uh, so I remember walking, and it was like a two-run game at, the, at that point. I was like, ah, oh, it's probably over, you know. Braves are down by two. And as we're walking out and we're getting closer to my car, I just hear the roar of the crowd. And then the fireworks go off, and you're like, yep, I, I just missed the comeback. I missed all of it. I missed the bottom of the ninth. I missed, I missed what I came to watch. But the truth is, I know if I stay, it will continue to be a, lo a loss. If I stay, they will lose. But the moment I step out, man, everybody starts hitting at that moment. Everybody starts hitting. Uh, and so that's a reminder for me of some of that. And so this morning, I just I want to encourage us in this way. I think sometimes we're that way when it comes to miracles. Like I think we pray and we ask the Lord for things, and then we just get tired of waiting. Like we reach the seventh inning and we're like, ah, it's not going to happen. And so we just move on. And we get in the car, and then I think some, what happens is then we miss the power. Like we miss that moment. Now, is that to say that every time we stay, the moment happens? No, just like going to a Braves game. Like sometimes they don't come back. Sometimes they don't. 
but sometimes they do. And so this morning, as we look at these miracles of Jesus, I want us to just tune into some of that. Like, I think for many of us in the church today, we've lost what it means to persevere. And we've lost the idea of endurance when it comes to seeking the Lord and seeking his power. So as we get into Matthew chapter 8, let me give us some context. Remember in Matthew 4, Jesus said, I'm here now, I'm the king, and I've come to establish a new kingdom. There's a kingdom of this world, and I've come to establish the kingdom of heaven. And these two kingdoms will clash for eternity. They will continue to clash until the end of days. There's no way to be in both of them. You have to choose one or the other. And to not choose the kingdom of heaven fully is to choose the kingdom of this world. Matthew 5 through 7, then Jesus gives the ethics of his kingdom. Here's what it looks like. And he gives us the commands, the laws of his new kingdom. He begins with the Beatitudes and works his way all the way through, uh, turning upside down what they interpreted the law to mean. And then last week we began in chapter 8 where Jesus comes down off the mountain and Matthew chose two stories to begin this part of his, uh, of his gospel with. He begins with the story of Jesus cleansing a man of leprosy. And the word is never healed. If you look back at that, he never asked to be healed. Nothing like that. Jesus never says you are healed. The word was cleanse. That was the word he used. And then from there we're learning that this is the first time this happened in 1,500 years. It's the only time A man had leprosy and was healed of it, and Jesus sends him to the priest, and go tell the priest, the Messiah is here. And then from there, we get uh, the story of the Roman centurion, the Roman soldier's servant who is at home sick, and the centurion comes pleading with Jesus, I know you can, I know you have the authority, with just a word you can heal him. And Jesus says, yeah, I'll come to your house, and the man says, no, I'm not worthy for you to be in my home, just say the word, like I know you can do it. And so miraculously, Jesus just speaks a word from, the, from a distance. He Steph Curry's this one and just gives the word from a distance. You'll get that one later. And he's, at that point, then, this, this uh, servant is, is healed. These are miraculous things. This, it's a cleansing and then an immediate healing just by the spoken word of Jesus. And then Matthew transitions now into this passage. It's interesting you got to feel a bit of the ride that Matthew's taking us on. Here's verse 14, when Jesus entered Peter's house. So we don't know much about Jesus' travels over the next three and a half years, but what we've come to learn is he probably had a home base here in Capernaum, but at Peter's house. It's probably where he was, Peter and Peter's wife and then Peter's mother-in-law. And so whenever Jesus was in town, he most likely stayed there. But he comes in and he sees Peter's mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. And he touched her hand, the fever left her, and she rose and began to serve him. So I don't want you to miss what's happening. Comparatively, this miracle feels much different than the previous two. So the first one with the man with leprosy, I mean, 1,500 years, no one's ever been healed of leprosy. And only the Messiah could do this. And so he steps in, cleanses the man of leprosy. And then this one where Jesus, from a distance, heals a Roman guard servant. From a distance, just speaks the word, and the man is healed. But this one, this one feels like something you and I could do. Like you, you've had kids, you've healed fevers before. You're like, hey, just take some Advil, take some ibuprofen. Here's a baby Tylenol, go take a cold bath. Like this feels like, come on, Jesus, this, like this. And Matthew felt the need to write this one down. This is like saying, and Jeremy ate at Chick-fil-A. Of course he did. That's what he does. Like, that's not miraculous. Like, this just feels like if we're, if we're tracking um, where you're like, you got Hall of Fame kind of miracles, and then you got like single A miracles, this is that one. This is like, ah, oh, you probably could have done that in high school. And it's different because this is someone he knows, and this is not in front of a crowd. Like, this is just in the privacy of her own home. And Jesus heals this woman, and she immediately then rises to serve. But then look at this in verse 16. Matthew is going to quote sort of as we get into verse 17. Here's verse 16. That evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word. Again, he's, he's back to that, the very word he used, the voice he used to speak creation into existence. Now he's casting out demons, and he healed all those who were sick. Now, uh, Mark and Luke give us their account of this, and they're telling us this is on a Sabbath day. Jesus had been in the synagogue. He had been teaching. He had been healing in the synagogue gets home, uh, heals Peter's mother-in-law, and then at sundown, when it's no longer the Sabbath, now people are being brought to Jesus, like literally carried to Jesus. They couldn't carry them on the Sabbath. They carry him now. In In the dark of the night, they come to Jesus. They waited till sundown. But then verse 17, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. 
He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. Now, most of our Bibles, whenever the New Testament quotes the Old Testament, has like a little footnote, and it, down at the bottom it will tell you, this is from Isaiah whatever. For most of us, this probably doesn't have a footnote for you because he's not really directly quoting Isaiah. This is kind of an amalgamation. This is a whole collaboration of Isaiah 53. So it's, Matthew summarizes Isaiah 53 into this sentence. He bore, he took our illnesses and bore our diseases. More on that later. And so now Matthew shifts now into a new section. This is verse 18. Um, Matthew, or Mark and Luke make this seem like it might have been a few days later. We're not real sure. But here's verse 18. When Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. He wants to go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and that's next week, but he wants to go over. And verse 19, a scribe came up. Now, a scribe is an expert in the law. He was probably a Pharisee. So uh, not all Pharisees are scribes, but all scribes are probably Pharisees. So it's a particular sect of the Pharisees that are scribes, and they are copyists. They copy the law. They write it down, and they're the ones who then teach the law. While the Pharisees are out running things and teaching more kind of morality, it's the scribes who are experts and teachers in the law. And they have an authority, and we just learned back in Matthew chapter 7, but Jesus seemed to have more authority than even the scribes about the law. But he comes up to Jesus, and he says, teacher. Now, there's two ways that we read the word teacher in the New Testament. One word means just teacher, like like a math teacher or science teacher, one who explains things. And the other one is the word rabbi. This is just the word teacher. He doesn't call him rabbi, uh, not a spiritual father. What he's saying is, hey, teacher like me. Like, I, I know a teacher a game recognizes game. It's like, I'm a teacher, you're a teacher. And then he says, I will follow you wherever you go. Which seems like, man, this guy's got a willing heart. He says, wherever. Not like, I'll, fo- I'll follow you. Some places you go, he says, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. So this scribe understood that while he was a teacher, this Jesus was a better teacher. And this Jesus was doing things that this, that this scribe has never done before. So he's like, man, I, I want to be part of that. How do, how do I get on that team? And maybe he's even looking at these fishermen who have been following Jesus, and he's like, these guys? Listen, like, I'm low on the totem pole when it comes to the synagogue, but if I follow Jesus with these guys, I'm I'm like the best one he's ever had. So I'm in. Like, I want to follow this Jesus. And so he says, I will follow you wherever you go. But it's interesting how Jesus responds to this man. He doesn't say, then let's go, right? He doesn't say, then let's just go. In John chapter 2, John tells us something about the way that Jesus sees humanity. John chapter 2, verse 23, that when Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, early in his ministry, many believed in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. So he knows many are coming to him because he's performing miracles. He's doing this instantaneous kinds of things. He's healing people. He's turning water into wine, which drew a whole different crowd. And now they're all following Jesus. But he recognizes in verse 24, Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. And he needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in a man. And what he recognizes is, listen, you're just following me because of what I can do. Like, you're here for the show. You've come because I put on a good show when you saw all the miracles, but he knows what's inside of the heart of a man. So he doesn't entrust himself to some people. He doesn't give himself over to them. And so we see this happen here in Matthew chapter 8. The man says, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus' response in verse 20 is, okay, but listen, Foxes have holes, and the birds of the air, they even have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So what he's saying is all creation has a home, right? Foxes have a home. Birds have a home. And then he calls himself the Son of Man, which is Jesus' favorite way to refer to himself throughout the Gospels. And what it is, it's, it's, it's actually a phrase that's been taken from the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, which is how Daniel prophesied of the Messiah. Whenever he referred to the Messiah, he called him the Son of Man. So here's what Jesus is saying. The first time Matthew uh, quotes Jesus saying this phrase, what Jesus is saying is, listen, I get you want to follow me, but you've got to understand, you think I'm powerful, you think I can do miracles, you think I'm a good teacher, I get all that, I'm flattered. Like, thanks for the Hallmark card, I'm flattered by what you're saying. But you've got to understand, this Messiah stuff, it comes with some discomfort. Like, to follow me, you got to understand, you've got it pretty good right now with your scribe gig. Like, you're doing pretty well. you got a nice home. Your family's there. Like, you need to understand, if you're going to follow me, the Messiah doesn't come with an address. I've got nowhere to lay my head. 
got nowhere to lay my head. Jesus here is calling out this scribe because he recognizes what the scribe wants is he wants the power and prestige of following Jesus, but doesn't want the pain and inconvenience that comes along with it. Like, do you see it? It's like, I'm going to follow you wherever you go. And Jesus knows what's in the man. He says, okay, but if you're going to do this, understand what comes along with it. It's not, all, it's not all games and shows. It's not all miracles. Like, there's pain and suffering almost on a nightly basis. I don't know where I'm going to be sleeping that night. Are you sure? Like, are you sure this is what you want? And then Matthew kind of doubles down. So then Matthew has chosen what stories to tell us, and he's done it on purpose. And he doubles down on this idea with the next story in verse 21. He says, another of the disciples. So we read disciples, we think the 12 apostles. That's not, the word disciple just means follower. So at this point, we don't know the 12. We just have people following Jesus. One of these followers of Jesus said to him, Lord, let me go first and bury my father. So some would say maybe Jesus asked him to follow him. Others say no, but he just offers this. He says, let me go first and bury my father. And this request seems appropriate. Like, you told me to honor my father and mother. Let me honor him in his death. I mean, honor what's happening here. So the truth is, as we unpack this verse, there's a lot of different understandings of what he's saying. And it runs the gamut, man. Like there's, uh, there's probably 40 different interpretations of what's happening here based on context and Jewish history. So I just, I want to give us just kind of a wide range of what this could actually mean because I don't know exactly what it means. But here's, here's where we've landed. This could have been anywhere from like a few days or a month to a number of years that this man is asking for. I don't really know. Just based on study, I don't really know where we land. It could be that his father has died, and then there's this whole Jewish ritual that comes along with a number of ceremonies and services and cleansings and burials. All of it has to happen. Or some say, you know what could have happened is this man is saying, listen, my dad's in perfect health, but I need him to die before I can follow you. Like Once he passes away, then I can follow you. Like, I've, I've got some stake here with my dad. I'm part of the family business. We don't really know. So this could have been anywhere from a few days to a few years. We don't really know. But either way, Jesus responds, and what for many of us feels like insensitive. Jesus' response is, yeah, 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 um, but follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. So either Jesus is just a punk who has no concern whatsoever about people's emotions Or Jesus, like in John chapter 2, knows what's in a man. So I'm going to err on that side, knowing that Jesus is good. I'm going to err on the side that Jesus knows what's in this man. And what I think he sees in this man is a delay tactic. So let me get some things straight, and then I will follow you. It seems here that Jesus questions the sincerity of this man because it feels inconvenient to him, doesn't fit his schedule. And so he calls out the man, says, fine. The invitation was to follow me. Not follow me, but, but follow me. And I think what he sees here is a delay tactic. So Jesus questions his sincerity. Because where, where the first scribe saw as uncomfortable, this man has to deal with the inconvenience of following Jesus. So I'm going to sum it up here in this way. I think these men wanted the power and prestige and pleasure of following Jesus without the perseverance it requires. I think Matthew's put all this together to tell us something about what it means to follow Jesus. The miracles are amazing. But if the only reason we're following Jesus is because of the signs and wonders, we're not going to make it through the dark night of the soul. And Jesus knows about these two men, that they, they want what comes along with Jesus, but he's not sure they actually want him. And so he calls them out for it. So this week for the high school, uh, football summer workouts start this week. And if you've ever played high school football, um, you dream of Friday Night Lights. Like you dream of that, the prestige that comes from that. And then you get that first dead week of summer. Like, man, I love summer. And then six o'clock comes on Tuesday morning. And you're like, I don't, I don't want to play football anymore. I don't want to do this ever again. This is the worst thing that's ever been invented. And so now you're in Georgia in the South and it's June. And you think, this is awful. What, six to nine? This is terrible. And then you find out in July, you got to do that twice in a day. And in July, it's 304 degrees and 900% humidity in Georgia. And you have to decide, like, do I, what do I want? Like, do I want the prestige that comes for being on the field on Friday night in the South? Or uh, do I actually want to do the work that it takes to get me there? And for every good coach, there's no way to Friday night without Tuesday morning in June. Now, 
The terrible coach is like, I don't care if you show up or not. No, the good ones care. They really do care. And so there's, there's that. So football. But then, man, we're in oldest. Let's talk about marching band. Can we talk marching band for a second? Like, you people are crazy. Like, I thought football was bad. You're insane. Like, nine to five in the summer? You sh- defects should be called for all of you, making your kids go do that. So like you, you want to be at halftime, you want to go to the shows, you want to get all the perfect scores, but if you're not willing to do the nine to five, you're not willing to do the nine to nines even throughout the summer, then you're not going to make it there. And so it's the same way for us in following Jesus, right? Like we want the power and prestige of these miracles. And Jesus says, yeah, but here's the thing, man. To get to the power, you got to go through the pain. And I'm just not sure that we want to go through the pain to get to the power. And it's not just here, like it's not just in these two stores. I think this whole passage is littered with this idea. So I don't, I don't like to do this at a ton. I think it compromises our understanding of Scripture. But I want to take us to some Greek just real quickly. There's three different Greek words for healing. In English, we're just lazy. Like we just take one word, like it means seven different things, which is fine. Like I love my wife and I also love burritos. And you can decide which one is which. And uh, in the 80s, bad was good and good was bad. And so that got real confusing for us. But in the Greek, uh, there's three words for healing, and the New Testament uses all three of them, but they all have their own kind of connotation to them, and it's important that we understand. So the first one is the word sozo, which is where we get the idea of salvation. It's complete healing. It's the healing through restoring the soul and spirit and body. This is the idea of salvation, to be saved. Sometimes the Bible translates that into be healed. It's to be saved spiritually, to be healed spiritually. This is salvation. The second Greek word is the word therapueo, which is where we get the word therapy. Like it gives us the word therapy. And what this means is the kind of healing that makes use of a responsive behavior over time. Now, if you've ever gone through therapy, like physical therapy, I think you understand some of this. Because you went through surgery and you're like, man, I got a torn rotator cuff. And so you go to surgery and you get that done. And the expectation is, you know, a few weeks I'll be able to do what I did before, at least somewhat, maybe like 80% of what I did before. But the doctors are like, no, 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 not so fast, my friend. I'm going, to su- I'm going to subject you to a living hell for six months first. And your body's going to bend in ways that didn't even bend before surgery. You're like, I don't want to get back to that. I just want to get back to being able to lift up my kids. You're like, no, 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 we're going to make you, a, we're going to make you the rookie of the year. Like, you're going to play baseball. And you're like, no, I just want to be able to lift up my kids. But this therapy is that. Therapy is, it kind of requires both parts, right? Like there's the therapist who's doing the work. And there's a responsive behavior. It's in the very same way that Jesus would say, um, take up your mat and walk. This is that word, therapio, which means, okay, it's healed. Now over time, you will step into more and more healing. It will, it will increase over time, but, but it demands response from us. And then the final word uh, is the word iaomai, which is just fun to say, but iaomai, which is instantaneous, miraculous healing. So when we think of healing in the Bible, this is the word we think of, iaomai. Here's the problem. The word that's most regularly used in the New Testament to speak of healing is therapueo, not this. And so when the Gospels speak of Jesus healing, and you, if, you, if you pay attention, you'll see it. Oftentimes, even with the man with leprosy, it's like, now go show yourself to the priest. There's, there's usually an action on our part that's required of it. And there's something over a sustained amount of time that creates more and more healing. But we like this, right? We like the iaomai kind of healing. So earlier in Matthew 8, when the Roman soldier's servant is healed, this is the word that's used. He's been iaomai'd from a distance. That's what's happening there. Jesus spoke and immediately, instantaneously, his servant was healed. But in this passage, let's go back. Matthew chapter 8, verse 16. That evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word instantly, and he healed all who were sick. You want to know what word that is for healed? Therapueo. He therapied all who were sick. So then you've got to, then what does that look like? Well, listen, it's sundown. What we believe is that Jesus, through the night, was therapueoing all of these people. So he's asking for response from them. He's beginning the healing, and then he's sending them with some sort of a task. Go show yourself to the priest. Go wash in the pool of Siloam. There's something that he's asking of them to do. This is uh, a long-term plan Jesus has put in place here. 
which, which makes this quote from Isaiah even more significant in verse 17. It was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. So the question is, well, what was filled? What was fulfilled? Iaomai was Iaomai fulfilled? No, no, no. Therapueo was fulfilled. Look at the words that Matthew uses to quote Isaiah. He took, he bore, which means he came under, he carried our illnesses and diseases. Illnesses are things that make you sick. Diseases are things that lead to death. And what Matthew tells us is that Jesus Therapueo owed these people because that fulfilled what he came to do, to come under, to bear, to come alongside of people. We want iaomai, but Jesus often therapueos instead. And so what Jesus sees with these men is, I know what you're here for, man. You're here for the show. Like, you're here for the, you're here for the iaomai. The problem is, I more often work with therapueo, and I'm just not sure you're ready for that. Like, I think you want the quick fix, and I don't often do the quick fix. I do more of the therapy. And I just don't know that you're ready because it seems like you're drawn to me for the miraculous instantaneous signs, and I'm just, I don't do that all the time. And so when things get hard, like when there's no place to lay your head and when it's inconvenient and you have to sacrifice time with your family to therapy owe somebody, I'm just not sure that you're ready for all of that. So these two men, the scribe and the disciple, say they want to follow Jesus, but... Like they want to follow Jesus, but they want it to be comfortable. They want to follow Jesus, but they want it to be convenient. And Jesus knows they're not ready. He knows they're not ready for the pain and the perseverance that's required to be a true follower of Jesus. They're not ready for the dark nights. They're not ready for the sleepless nights and for the pain. They're not ready for the phone calls. They're not ready for all of that. But they're not ready for the suffering. And so in grace, Jesus says, this is what it looks like to follow me. I need you to count the cost and make sure you're ready to do this. Even for us in America, we think following Jesus is full of iaomai. It's actually more of therapueo. It's more of that. Following Jesus means sitting at hospitals with friends who are grieving and in pain and, and lonely and confused about what is happening. I think of people in our church. I think of Woody and Lauren Johnson who have gone just to sit with Jeff Steltzer. His wife Angie is undergoing test after test and sedated, trying to figure out what's what, what's happening. And who go and sit with Jeff while he communicates horrific news to his children. What does it look like to follow Jesus? That's what it looks like to follow Jesus. It looks like our pastor of care, senior adult pastor Brian Wade, going to sitting with people in hospitals, taking his day off to spend hours counseling couples to help restore and redeem their marriage, even though the truth is they're not sure they want to restore it. And sure, like we pray for Iaomai, like give us, give us one hour with them and make everything restored. Rarely does that happen. Like I've never experienced that. But it's the day in and day out, every day striving and working. It's Brandon and Allison Turner who have continually given themselves to serve, to come alongside. Is there a need? What's the need? Well, it cost me something. I don't care. I'm in. So what it means to follow Jesus is this. It's therapueo. It's gritty and it's grimy. And it's full of sweat and exhaustion and tears. It's sitting in hospitals. It's, it's discipling someone from a drug addiction to ministry. It's walking alongside of them. It's early mornings at Chick-fil-A meeting with somebody. It's, it's seeing people fail over and over and over again. It's your own failure over and over and over again. It's praying for your kids and pleading uh, on their behalf before the King of Kings. This is what it means. And what Jesus sees in the scribe and this disciple is, man, they're not ready for this journey. Like they want the quick fix. And in his grace, he's like, I just, you need to know. You need to know. Whatever the, the televangelist sold you about following me, it's not like that. Whatever you're seeing, it's not actually like this. Now, sometimes through the grit and the grime, if we persevere and stay through the bottom of the ninth, we see the comeback. We see it. And we see the miracle. And sometimes we don't. And in that is a miracle. But you don't get to see either if you give up. Like if we, if we bail, if we jump ship in the seventh inning, we don't get to see any of it. And the truth is, you and me, particularly as Americans, we are creatures of comfort and convenience. And we, like the scribe and the disciple, have said, Jesus, I will follow you. 
but make it comfortable. I will follow you, just please don't inconvenience me. And honestly, like sometimes as a church staff, like I think we try to make it more convenient and maybe to our detriment. Like we'll say, hey, would you come and help serve kids, serve the kids? You don't need to prepare a lesson or anything. Just be there for them. I wonder if that actually helps or hurts us. Is it convenient to be in a room of 50 first through fifth graders? Good gracious, no. Like that's one of the circles of hell for some of us. Like that's awful. They don't listen to their own parents. They're not going to listen to you. Like, who are you? You're not my dad. That's, that will happen. Is it convenient to get here early and then to sit and hold crying babies and walk them back and forth in the hallway while your pastor preaches for too long? Like, is that convenient? No. Is it comfortable? No. No, it's not. I think sometimes we're like, yeah, I should do it. It's easy. No, it's not. It's not. Like, is it comfortable to sit in front of a group of 14-year-olds who are judging everything you say and even the things you're wearing at this moment? No. But if you care what seventh graders think of you, we have a whole different conversation we need to have together. It's not, man. Like, is it convenient that you get a phone call from a kid who's struggling and wrestling with this? Like, no. Is it convenient that you've got to prepare a lesson to lead a small group on a Sunday morning? No. Is it convenient that sometimes you have to change your vacation plans because you've agreed to serve at some point? No. It's not. Like, to follow Jesus, to really do this, is not comfortable and it's not convenient. And I'm telling you, you will see this summer the idol of comfort in your own life. Because once the sun comes out and every white person thinks they're going to tan, we run to the beach. I'm not saying you can't miss the sun. I'm not saying that. I'm not being legalistic about it. I'm just saying it should grieve you a little bit, not excite you. You get to miss church. Like There should be we get to, not a we have to, about this. Like we get to do this. And when it comes to serving, like you, we get to. We get to pour our lives out. We get to hold little babies and sing over them. We get to give their mama a chance to just breathe for an hour and a half and worship the Lord. We get to do that. We get to serve. We get to give. But because we're such creatures of comfort and convenience, here's the sad truth. We are without the power of God. We've jumped ship, and we're pleading, God, where's your power? And God's like, I have the power for you. you got to endure through the pain. And as Americans, we're like, no, nah, I'm out. Pain, I'm out. Like, some of you right now are like, it's too cold in here. That, that's the inconvenience? But there's people in China who will be shot to death if they get found going to church. But we're without the power of God. So in Acts chapter 19, the church at Ephesus has just started. And it's starting to catch uh, fire a little bit. But there's this moment that happens that really escalates everything. So Paul has been radically saved. He was Saul, uh, but he went more with his Gentile named Paul. And and he's been radically saved and transformed by God. Jesus literally came from heaven and met him on the road. And there's been great power through him because he's endured pain and perseverance to get to where he is. So here's Acts chapter 19, verse 11. God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. So that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched Paul's skin were carried away to the sick. And then Paul, at late night television, would sell those for nineteen ninety five. If you just call now, you can get these. <laughs> if that offends you, I'm, it should. I'm sorry. <laughs> they were carried away to the sick, and the, their diseases left them, and evil spirits came out of them. Paul, like literally, the clothes he was wearing, if his dirty clothes touched somebody, they were miraculously healed by it. And then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists, which that's a job, huh? So they're traveling Jewish people who are casting out demons. This is is what they do. I think it's like the power team from when we were kids. They're just traveling around. They undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. But watch, here's what they say. I adjure you, I compel you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. So they're borrowing on the power of Paul Paul, who has experienced pain, has persevered through it, who's confessed and repented, who continually is face to face with the thorn in his flesh. They're like, hey, that looks awesome. Let me just do what he does. And so they appeal to the evil spirits. I compel you by Paul's God to come out of this man. 
Then verse 14, there's seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva. So the seven sons of Sceva were doing this. Seven biblically means perfection. So there's this perfect group of sons of this itinerant priest, and they're doing this. But an evil spirit answered them in verse 15. Catch this. Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize. But who the heck are you? That's my own translation. So even the demons speak back and say, listen, like, we know Jesus. Like He's caused problems for us for a while now. And we don't like his name being used around here. So I get that. And then Paul, he's kind of new on the scene, but I feel like it's the same thing that's happening. So we know Paul, but we have no idea who, who you are. And truthfully, you're not a threat to us. Jesus, we've dealt with and we're scared of. Like we're scared to death of him. We tremble when he comes near. We're starting to feel that way about Paul. We recognize that name, but I don't know who you are. And then watch what happens. The man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, on the seven sons of Sceva. One verses seven, and he mastered, he overtook all of them, overpowered them. So they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Now, I came to love this passage a number of years ago. I heard a pastor preach on it, and uh, I was like, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell the story the way he tells the story. Then I realized that's plagiarism, and I can't do that. So I'm going to quote him, and it's not going to feel like a quote I should ever quote somebody on. Like, it's going to feel like that's not very monumental. Like, it's funny, but I need to go somewhere with it. So this is from Matt Chandler. He's a pastor in Texas. Here's what he says. He says, if you've ever watched a fight and then talked about the fight afterwards, there's always debate about who won the fight. But here's a general rule. If when the fight started, you were wearing pants, and when the fight ended, you no longer had pants, you lost. <laughs> like, I wish I could tell that, and you laugh and think, I'm funny, but it, I can't. Like, that's his. So they get overtaken, and they're naked. Then, he, then Chandler goes on to say this. Nobody's going to be like, well, he got that one hook in. No, you came in with drawers, and when it was over, you weren't wearing drawers. You lost the fight. So here's, here's why I say... All, all of that. The danger with these two men in Matthew chapter 8 was this very same thing. They wanted to claim the power of Jesus without the presence of God. Like they wanted to borrow from his power without actually submitting ourselves, themselves to it. And here's where it has to hit us today. The same thing is true for the church in America today. And it's why, as a church, Big C Church, we're getting our teeth kicked in and our pants beat off of us. Because while the world is moving further and further towards darkness, we, as the Christian church in America, have abandoned the perseverance it takes to get to the power of Jesus. And so we've made everything about comfort and convenience. We run from suffering, we run from hard times, we run when it gets hard, and we claim, well, Jesus doesn't love me, this can't be what it is. Or, no, no, Jesus loves you, just wait and you'll see your breakthrough. But what if you don't? What if the healing never comes? What if your marriage doesn't get restored? Is God still who he says that he is? This is the church in America. I think, I think the demon, I think the enemy to the church says, Jesus I know, and Paul I've heard of. I've never heard of you, Sharon. What a sad commentary on the state of the church. But it's why I think we're seeing a mass exodus of young people. Because I think they grew up in a church full of prosperity preaching, but devoid of the power of God. I think our young people have grown up in a church more devoted to nationalism than to the spirit of the holy God. I think they've grown up in a church full of pastors who have made their living off of proclaiming subpar truth to people desperate for anything that looks like hope to them. Instead, of what Peter calls in 1 Peter, people who have been tried by fire. Look around. 
the American church is getting the pants beat off of her. June, the month of June, will show you all you need to know about the church in America. And sure, we get angry and we get upset. You want to know why? Because we've been exposed and we're ashamed and we respond with anger. Remember in, uh, I think it was fifth grade, I went to turn a piece of paper, a paper in to my language arts teacher. And my friend Kurt came up behind me and pulled my pants down in front of the whole crowd. You can laugh. It's okay. It's funny. And I was, I was, uh, I was not very tall. Like I was a tiny little, little guy at the time. And so my shirt covered enough of it. But the instant reaction was anger. You know that moment? Like when you're embarrassed, it's anger. So you know what we're seeing the church do? to darkness in America today, respond with anger. And why? Because we don't have the power of God behind us. And we're embarrassed and ashamed that we've had the pants beat off of us. And we're seeing a mass exodus of young people and, on the other side, a growing legalism and obsessive nationalism among the older people. We've been playing church And we, like the scribe, have said, yeah, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus says, it's going to be uncomfortable. And we're like, no, not in America. And we say, I want to follow you. And Jesus says, well, then it's going to be convenient. It's going to cost you some stuff. I don't know, man. I mean, I want to follow you, but I got this thing with my dad. And I think the enemy is saying, you claim Jesus problem is I've never had an issue with you. You can play church all day long. The enemy sees no threat in the American church. We want to fight cultural issues, but we have no power behind it. Look at your own families. Sure, you want to plead the power of God over your families. What evidence do you have? Like, what are you doing to persevere to get to the power of God? You get your travel ball schedule and it becomes the idol in your family. Don't tell me you want the power of God in your family. You got a chance to go to the lake and so you abandon serving in kids or in our preschool. Don't tell me you want the power. I love you. I love you. But you can't plead for the power of God while punt on your responsibilities as a follower of Jesus. You're begging for restoration in your marriage and you're still walking in pornography. You can't plead for the power of God to restore your marriage while you're still succumbing to the comfort and convenience of that woman on the screen. You can't plead for God to rescue and save your children while at the age of seven you hand them a device connected to the internet. This is this is it, man. Like if we want the power of God, it will inconvenience and discomfort us, and that should not be a surprise to anybody. It's been that way since the beginning of time. D.A. Carson says it this way. says, little has done more to harm the witness of the Christian church than the practice of filling its ranks with every volunteer who is willing to make a little profession, talk fluently of experience, but display little of perseverance. It's going to take some grit. It's going to take some griminess. It's going to take some dirt and filth for us. But we're leaving in the third inning because it got hot. But Paul told Timothy this would happen. In 2 Timothy 3, he says, understand this, in the last days, Timothy, there will come times of difficulty. Then people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents. I love that's in there. Like as a parent, I love, but also as a follower of Jesus, I love how significant that is. Ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And you can't tell me that's not the state of America in 2023. But here's what's interesting. Verse 5, they have the appearance of godliness and deny its power. Here's what Paul is telling to the young preacher boy named Timothy. You know who this is? This is the church full of all of this. They love themselves. They love money. They're greedy. They disobey their parents. And on the outside, they look godly, but they deny the power because the power of God transforms the soul. We can play church all we want, but the truth is we too want the power, prestige, and pleasure of following Jesus. 
without the perseverance it requires. It is inconvenient and uncomfortable to follow Jesus. Daryl said it last week, being saved costs you nothing. Being a disciple costs you everything. It's always been uncomfortable and inconvenient to follow Jesus. Always. And it always will be. There will never be a day when a nation says, man, that is so good. I love how you feel about people's sexuality. We should adopt that as a nation. It will never happen. What it requires is perseverance, and we can't run back to our old gods of comfort and convenience when things get hard. So right now, I believe the church is being exposed. I think we're being exposed as weak and thin with no roots and no substance. That's what's happening, I think, in America. I think we're being exposed. And while we complain about uncomfortable chairs and faulty air conditioning, our brothers and sisters in China are going under the cover of night to find themselves gathered together to worship Jesus. You know what's happening in communist China? The church is flourishing. You know what's happening in Iraq and Iran? The church is flourishing. While in America, we're such creatures of comfort and convenience. But there's good news. Like, there's good news, I think, when the church is exposed. So here's the rest of what happens in Acts chapter 19 as Brandon comes up. Here, here's, here's more of what happens. Verse 17, this thing became known. The seven sons of Skeena run, Skeva running out naked. This all became known, which it should be. Like, it got known. The residents of Ephesus, but Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of Jesus was extolled. It was lifted high. Also, many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. Here's what happens. When the church is exposed, the true believers confess. When the church is exposed as thin and weak and pedantic and just claiming the name of Jesus but having no power, when that happens, the church says, no, 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 that's me. Like it's not the big C church, I've done that. And so the Christians come forward, they confess and they divulge, no, I've been doing that at home. I haven't done this with my kids. I haven't done this in my workplace. It's me, it's me. Like, it's not just the big C, it's me. I, I have a role to play in this. But then watch this. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts, Ephesus was known for their magic arts. They brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them, and it came to 50,000 pieces of silver, which in today's terms is $5.5 million. So when the church was exposed in Ephesus and the people of God came forward to confess and divulge their practices, the whole economy of Ephesus was turned upside down. It would be like if the church in America felt the exposure and instead of becoming angry, confessed and divulged their practices and the porn industry crumbled and we watched it fall. That's what it would be like. And yet pornography is a multi-billion dollar industry. is what it would be. If the church responds this way, and then look at verse 20, so the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. There is hope, church. There's hope. We're being exposed as not practicing what we're preaching. And we're seeing it. We're seeing our young people leave the church. We're seeing the rest of us attend while devoting our hearts to nationalism instead of to the allegiance of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And while we're being exposed, the call is to confess and divulge. What are we doing? You want the power of God? It comes through pain and perseverance. And sure, we can sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. I just wonder if we actually have. And it can't be I followed the Jesus of my pastor. I followed the Jesus of my grandma. Oh, are we following Jesus today? Power of Jesus is found in perseverance. So what do we do? Well, we count the cost. Don't make a decision to follow Jesus without this. Count the cost. The Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Jesus was uncomfortable. What makes us think that we get to be comfortable? Follow Jesus is uncomfortable. He says, let the dead bury their dead. It's, in, it's inconvenient. There's never a good time. You know how you were like, hey, when things slow down, then I'll serve in the student ministry? How's that going for you? Things slowing down? 
If you're like me, things never slow down. They just ramp up, especially when you're waiting for things to slow down. It's never a good time. It's never convenient. You never have enough money to finally start giving. You never have enough time to finally start serving. You never have enough biblical knowledge to finally start discipling your kid. That will never happen. It's uncomfortable. It's inconvenient. So what do we do? We confess and we divulge our practices. So as Brandon plays, we've got a few minutes. I'm just going to invite you, church. If you want the power of God, I'm going to invite us into confession and divulgence. It might mean a friend you talk to. It might mean you just come up here and bow at the altar. It might mean you find a pastor or an elder or a small group leader and you just need to say, it's me, it's me, it's me. I've been pleading for power while I've given up early. No, I believe in the power of the light of Jesus to push back darkness in our world. I believe it. And I believe the church is the tip of the spear when it comes to it. But we've punted on our responsibilities in the names of comfort and convenience. It's not a call to be angry. It's a call to submit ourselves to the power of the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. The hope is not lost. There will be a day when the church reigns victorious. It begins today with confession and devotions. I'm going to pray if you feel led to and you need to pray in your seat. You can come forward. You can stand. You can do whatever you need to, but I think it's time, church, for us to respond to the exposure in a way that actually brings power rather than embarrassment. Father, we come to you today. In all honesty, Father, many just men, like men, God, we come to you as men today saying, no, that's us. We've punted on our responsibility as husbands. Like we haven't loved our wives as you've loved the church. We've condemned and we've criticized and we've just gotten lazy. We've given up. We stopped pursuing her. We've stopped wooing her. We've stopped serving her. We've come home from work tired thinking we deserve to sit on the couch instead of just praying for you to give us the power to go serve our, our wives the way you serve the church. It's us. And as fathers, God, we've punted on our discipling responsibility of our kids, and we've delegated that to Carly and to Natalie and Micah and Cody, and instead, God, it's us. It's on us. Father, the women in the room, they confess the same thing, God. They've punted on the responsibility to respect their husbands, to lift them up, to believe in the leading of the Holy Spirit through their men. They've succumbed to the pressure and the comparison of Instagram, and they've tried to make uh, sup superb memories for their kids rather than just being present in the day-to-day. -day. And we confess it's us. Students, God, the students, I know, they want to confess to you it's them. Like, sure, their parents have done things, but it's on them now. They're old enough now. They confess. They've looked at the things they shouldn't. They've gone places they shouldn't. They've smoked and snorted and drank things they shouldn't have. They've done it. They've been disobedient. And so, God, in our confession, we're asking that you would give us perseverance through the pain, that we would endure, that we might see the miracle on the other end. And even if we don't, that we'd praise you. Because in the journey of perseverance, we've come to know a God who is good. And so while we pray for restoration and healing and freedom from bondage of addiction, God, we more importantly pray for your presence to give us power. And we pray the church would rise and the light of the gospel would go forth. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.